Oh, thanks, Laura. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Sue Wyatt, and I am a family education specialist here at Starbridge. One of my roles is to help families directly with supports and services such as providing information. Um, to a lesser extent, we might attend a CSE meeting or do a personal meeting with a family, but most of what we do is try to empower families to be best advocates for their children, as they know the children better than we ever will. So welcome to the webinar. Today we're going to do an overview of the Committee on Special Education, also known as CSE, and I'm going to be kind of using CSE and Committee on Special Education interchangeably. I will probably use CSE more frequently just because it's shorter and easier to say. But just know that when I say that CSE term, it means Committee on Special Education. So the committee is a multidisciplinary team that's established in accordance with education laws. And it determines whether a student is eligible for special education or an individualized education program, also known as an IEP. And if the student is not eligible for an IEP, other options could include a 504 plan or possibly a change in building level supports and services. The role of the CSE is to, one, review and discuss information from the evaluations that identify the student's needs, and we'll uh, talk more about evaluations a little bit later, um, to determine eligibility for special education, and to determine the classification that the student might have. We'll talk about more of that on that later as well. To discuss the goals the student can meet in the coming year, and to review programs and services for the student to help them access their education, including things like where they're going to receive their supports and services. Um, why is not, okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a slight technical difficulty there. So when I say special education, what comes to mind? Um, for most people, depending on your age, and if you're I, I confess I'm, I'm a product of the 70s, so my um, experience with special education from back in the day was they would take those kids and put them in another room and they would teach them somewhere else. Um, a, lot of, a lot of folks that are my age and a little bit older might think that you know, you're segregating the child and that they'll never earn a diploma. And I get calls to this day from families who are fearful of their children being labeled or not graduating a diploma if they receive special education. But in reality, special education has the job of ensuring all students equal access to education, which means we use the term FAPE, which stands for Free Appropriate Public Education. We'll come to that a little bit more later. It ensures that students are educated in the least restrictive environment that will meet their needs. Special education is governed by a federal law called IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It was first passed as the Education for All Handicapped Children Act in 1975, and it was reauthorized in 1990 as IDEA, and then reauthorized and updated two more times after that in 2004 and 2009. What does IDEA do? It provides supports and services to students found to be eligible under very specific disability categories. And it ensures that every student is entitled to a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment that meets their needs. The basic premise is that all kids get a chance to go to school and have a fair chance to learn. The purpose of IDEA is to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them a free appropriate public education, emphasizing the special education and related services designed to meet their unique needs and to prepare them for further education, employment, and independent living. And it's also to ensure that the rights of children with disabilities and their families are protected. So in summary, IDEA is a federal law. It provides supports and services to students found eligible under specific disability categories. And there's a, a in the handouts, there are links to all of this information that you can find there. So each state decides 
how to implement the federal law. A state can provide more than the federal law says they have to, but they can never provide less. New York State has laws governing special education as well, and they're determined by the New York State Education Department, also known as NYSED. Part 100 is for general education students. Part 200 is for special education students. So if you want to look at the laws for New York State, you can go and look up the 232 pages <laughs> that are on that website. Um, and you can print it out if you want a really good doorstop. Uh, but um, as stated earlier, uh, New York State can do more than IDEA, but not less. So why do we need to know about federal and state laws? Some schools cite school policy as a reason to do or not to do something for the child. Just remember, that school policy is allowed to provide more, but never less than what is required by federal and state laws. So what's FAPE? It's free, which means there's no cost for families. It's appropriate. Now notice that we don't use the word best here. It's rather what is appropriate to meet the student's needs. It's public. It takes place at public schools and private schools are another animal. Call us if you have questions about that. And it provides the education for the student. IDEA also recognizes the importance of preparing students for life after high school. So how do you access supports and services? Phone calls, emails, meetings with teachers and principals do not always result in special education services. What is needed is a written referral. So let's quickly review the process. First, you start with a referral to the Committee on Special Education. A referral can be done by a parent or by school staff. Then, evaluations are done to determine how the student is currently functioning in the school. Eligibility is determined at the CSE meeting. To be eligible for special education, a student must be classified under one of the 13 disability categories, and there's a handout on that too. An IEP is developed, and then they look at placement. And this is where the supports and services will be delivered. The committee will look at what kind of a classroom is appropriate based on the IEP needs. Every year, the IEP is looked at by the committee, which means parents are involved as well. At the annual review, a program for the next school year will be developed. Now, it's important to know that a CSE meeting can be held at any time. This is called a program review, and if a parent wants this, they should submit a letter to the CSE chair. So who can make a referral to the CSE? A parent, that's probably the most common. Although I've heard from many parents who, you know, ask and ask, and I fall into this category too. I was asking and asking and nothing happened. It wasn't until I actually wrote a letter that things started happening. Sometimes a teacher or other educational professional can make a referral. Often, oftentimes a medical professional will submit um, documentation, but it's rare that they will actually write the referral to the Committee on Special Ed. So here's the key. A parental request has to happen in writing to the director of special education or the CSE chairperson for the district. The initial referral should include a request for evaluations and a request for the CSE review upon completion of those evaluations. Now, if time is of the essence, we suggest that parents take their letter in person to the school and ask to sign the consent form before they leave. If time is not an issue, you can wait for the district to send the consent form home. Now, once the district has received the written request or referral to the director of special ed, they have 10 days to get a consent form back to you for you to sign. 
Now, this is your consent for the district to conduct evaluations and determine eligibility for special education services. When you sign the consent to evaluate, this is important because this is when the clock starts ticking, but the uh, consent form lists the evaluations that are going to be provided. Uh, these evaluations will assess the child, and sometimes when you look at that list, you may decide that maybe they need to do an additional evaluation, such as a sensory uh, processing evaluation, or maybe an assistive tech evaluation for your child just because uh, that may not be one of their standard evaluations. And you can ask for that when you sign the consent form. So what kind of things go into the, the evaluations? So it's starting with the basics. They look at the student's overall health, vision, hearing, motor abilities. Social history is also considered, and this is where the parents have an opportunity to provide some input and they can report on their child's strengths and areas of struggle. Classroom observations are used to see how the student interacts with teachers and peers in the classroom. Evaluators also look at existing data such as classwork, performance on state exams, recent report cards or progress reports. A psychological educational evaluation is conducted. Now this determines the student's present levels of performance and addresses the student's needs for supports in order to access and make progress in the general education curriculum. Now evaluations must not discriminate based on a student's language, race, culture, mode of communication such as sign language or assistive tech. So districts have to take all of those factors into account when they do the evaluations. Now, what does this big 60 mean? 60 days um, from when you sign the evaluation, for, uh, the consent for evaluations, the clock starts, the clock is ticking at that point, and the district has 60 days in order to get the evaluations done and schedule the CSE meeting. Now, that's 60 calendar days, which is roughly two months. The district has 60 school days, roughly three months, from submitting the signed consent to developing the IEP and implementing the IEP. So there's where that big 60 comes in. So 60 calendar days for conducting the evaluations and scheduling the meeting, 60 school days to implementing the IEP. So who are members of the Committee on Special Ed? Some of them are required, but others are optional. So required CSE meetings are the parent, you are an integral part of this team because you, again, know your child better than anyone else at the table. And of course, you're their best advocate. The chairperson for, for the local education agency, uh, the, dis, the school district. This is a person who can make decisions about what the school can offer and where the child can be placed. A person qualified to interpret the evaluations and the school psychologist. The school psychologist conducts the bulk of the evaluations, the psychoeducational evaluation in particular, but also you could have uh, maybe a speech therapist or an occupational therapist at the meeting if those evaluations were conducted. A general education teacher. This is somebody that hopefully is working with your child and they would know them in the classroom. And a special education teacher. Now, if your child has not been classified before, you, they may not have a special education teacher in their life, but a special education teacher can speak to the kind of needs that they can uh, address. Optional attendees could be a school physician if your child has medical issues that impact their school day and that would need to be submitted as a written request. Sometimes the student attends. Um, a lot of times uh, a student is too young to attend, but as students get older, it's really important that their voice be heard either in person or possibly uh, they could fill out a, a form that addresses their own needs and their dislikes and likes. A parent member could also attend. 
this is uh, somebody that uh, has a child in your district. They do not work for the district, but they have a child who receives special education services in your district. Now, if you would like a parent member to attend, you have to give the district at least 72 hours notice. Um, now, just have a note that the role of the parent member is to make sure that the parent understands the special ed process. They are not there as an advocate for your child. Others, um, parents can invite other people such as family members, friends. Um, sometimes uh, we've had single parents that would bring a family friend along uh, just so that they could have somebody to write things down for them while they talk to the committee. Um, you could also request an advocate to be there on your behalf. Um, but again, it's good practice to notify the committee well in advance if you're having somebody else that's not on the list that they send you. Five days in advance of your meeting, that's five calendar days. So you might get the meeting notice on a Thursday for a meeting on a Tuesday. Just So sometimes we've had parents that uh, complain about the short notice, but they're required to give you five calendar days. Um, parents should receive a notice in writing. It should include the purpose of the meeting, the date, the time, the location, and a list of attendees. And again, this is where you can look at that list of attendees and you can request your parent member, you can request uh, somebody else to attend with you. Sometimes you would have to schedule a CSE meeting on short notice, and then you may be asked to waive that five-day notice requirement. How does a parent prepare for a CSE meeting? And I had no clue walking into my first CSE meeting what to do. So this is something that um, we've tried to help families to understand. The meeting preparation is key if you want to represent your child as best as possible. So you could gather report cards, evaluations, samples of schoolwork. You should ask for a copy of the evaluations in advance. Hopefully those would be presented to you along with the meeting notice, but it's not always the case. But it would be nice if you uh, put that in your uh, request for, uh, or when you sign your consent form, that you ask for a copy of the results when they're available. Also in our handouts today, there is a link to something called a guide to meeting preparation. This is a relatively new thing that Starbridge developed. And it, I've had feedback from families that it's been very useful for them to organize their thoughts and their goals in advance of the meeting and help them stay focused during the meeting on those goals and, and um, thoughts that they want to uh, accomplish at the meeting. So here we are at the CSE meeting. It's the moment of truth. Now, ideally, the meeting is collaborative and not intimidating. I've been in both situations, <laughs> and sometimes uh, parents are not as well prepared as they should be and then it can be very intimidating. But parents should walk in confident that they're well prepared because they have done the work necessary to be the best advocates for their children. And that includes doing things like looking over the evaluations, writing down their goals and their thoughts for the meeting and what they would like to accomplish. So what actually happens at the CSE meeting? There's a excuse me, attendance gets taken. There's usually a sign-in sheet and everyone signs in with their name and their title. The evaluations are reviewed um, and these could be, again, the evaluations that were done by the professionals in the room, but it could also be samples of the child's work. All of this is done to assess the student's strengths and the student's area of needs that need to be supported. So now, is the student eligible for special education? And if yes, what is the classification? We have a handout in the a list there uh, for the 13 classifications in New York State. So you can have a look at that. It also discusses on the first page eligibility requirements before it gets into the um, classifications. So if the student is found eligible for special education supports and services, an individualized education program or an IEP is developed by the CSE team. Sometimes a draft IEP is prepared by the school in advance. This, I was fortunate enough to be in a district that did this for me. 
the IEP includes current levels of performance, related services such as speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, special transportation, things like that that the student might need. Placement, where will the student receive the supports and services? Where will they be educated? And any appropriate accommodations or modifications to the um, education program that the student needs to access their education. Goals are developed noting what skills will be worked on. And here's where parents have to take, um, take note that the goals are for one year. So parents often look at, you know, what are they going to do when they graduate from high school and they're only in fifth grade? Well, they have to be accomplished within one year. The IEP identifies how the school resources need to be coordinated in, in order to support the student's needs. So the IEP provides accountability, so everyone is on the same page. It guides instruction, and it supports participation in the general education curriculum. One of the um, links in the handout is to uh, something called plain language IEPs that was developed by our partners. Uh, that is a really good resource for families to look at and helping them understand what's written on that document. Key thought, you, a parent, are a member of the Committee on Special Education. Your collaboration or give and take with the school helps you work towards your child's progress. You are your child's best advocate and at the end of the day, it's your home they come back to and you will be in their lives long after they're done with school. So just remember that you are key in your, parent, in your child's success. Annual reviews. IEPs have to be re reviewed by the committee on an annual basis. Now, do you have to wait a year to make any changes? Absolutely not. A CSE meeting or program review can be requested in writing at any time to review programs and services and to make changes. And again, you would need to write a letter to ask for that program review. Now, every three years, a student has to be reevaluated. And that would be all those evaluations that were done initially have to be repeated just to make sure the student is still eligible and to determine the current levels of performance, which may have changed over three years. Now, do you have to wait three years to get new evaluations? No. There's two things a parent can do. For example, if you disagree with the initial findings, you can request an independent educational evaluation. Um, we can talk about that if you wanted to call us about that. We can help you with that. Um, a parent or teacher can request a new evaluation in writing if the situation warrants. Again, if the teacher requests it, the parental consent is required for, to conduct that evaluation. So, key takeaways here. So, special education provides specially designed instruction by a special education teacher. We've talked about the process of referral, evaluation, determining eligibility, developing an IEP, determining placement, having an annual review, coming back to reevaluations, and the process repeats. Goals, supports, and services are specified and outlined in the IEP. Quick note about 504 plans. If a student is not eligible for special education, they may be offered a 504 plan. A 504 plan is designed to give students with disabilities equal access to the general education curriculum as their typical peers. One thing to note for parents, it does not depend on your student's grades. Um, sometimes students with good grades can still get a 504 plan. The cornerstone of the law is equal access. So Section 504 requires school districts to provide FAPE to qualified students with a disability, and equal access is the key here. They have to have equal access to their education as their typical peers. Now, equal access may not look, quote unquote, fair to other students in the classroom. 
but just remember that equal is not always fair and fair is not always equal. A student with disabilities may need more resources than the student that doesn't have disabilities. Things like um, access to a computer to write uh, paragraphs could be considered an accommodation for a student with a disability in writing, for example. So who's eligible for a 504 plan? A person with a disability who has one, only one is needed, major life activity impacted in their schooling uh, career. Now, an impairment may limit only one major life activity and still be considered a disability. For example, a student will be considered to have a disability if his or her impairment substantially limits reading, even if it does not substantially limit learning. Many students have symptoms that interfere with reading, writing, concentrating, thinking, communicating, etc., but the student is still able to maintain good grades. They have excellent coping skills, but they still struggle a lot, and so they could use some accommodations. Oftentimes, students are denied because they're passing, maintaining good, grade, good grades, or even earning high grades. The Act clearly states that the impairment may limit only one major life activity and does not have to limit more than one, such as learning, that many schools insist need to be impacted in order to be eligible for a 504 plan. The symptom must limit a major life activity, for example, writing, but does not need to to impact the major life activity of learning. This is sometimes confusing, but the law is clear that only one major life activity must be limited for a student to be eligible. Students can have symptoms that interfere with reading, writing, concentrating, thinking. Even if the student is able to maintain good grades, they can have a 504 plan. So what are some of these major life activities? Okay, they're, they include, but they're not limited to these things that you see on the screen. Um, caring for oneself, performing tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, et cetera, et cetera. Learning is in there, but it doesn't have to be the only thing, or it doesn't have to be that for the student to be eligible for a 504 plan. The good news is, a 2008 amendment to the 504 law says that symptoms can be episodic and fluctuate daily or over a longer period of time. Fluctuating system, sim, symptoms would not disqualify a student as being seen as a student with a disability if symptoms are not always present, but when they are present, they do impact a major life activity. One example is a student that has ADHD but takes meds for that. And so when they're on the meds, the ADHD is controlled. But when they're off the meds, the symptoms can return. Sensory issues, OCD, ADD, processing delays are many more examples of episodic and inconsistent symptoms. It's important for a parent to, uh, who's attempting to obtain a 504 plan for a student with episodic symptoms to be prepared to demonstrate specifically how those symptoms substantially limit a life activity when those symptoms are active. So you have to do your work. So the amendment points out that it's appropriate to have a 504 plan in place even if the symptoms interfere inconsistently and may not be present at the time of the meeting. A plan needs to be in place for when those symptoms return. So what kind of accommodations can a student get? They could get related services like occupational therapy or speech therapy. They might get extra time on assignments or tests. They might have preferred seating. Um, maybe they need to sit in the front of the room so they can hear the teacher better. Maybe they need to sit in the back of the room so that they can get up and move around if they need to. Some students get a copy of the class notes so that they don't, if they have a difficulty with writing, that they can keep up. Some students may need assistive technology or special devices for writing. There's many more accommodations that students can get and the list is one of the things in your handout. 
So what's the difference between a 504 plan and an IEP? A 504 plan provides equal access to the general education curriculum through accommodations and changes to the environment. It could include things like we discussed there, like preferred seating, uh, books on tape, or taking extra breaks, time uh, on tests, or extra time to pass from uh, classroom A to classroom B, and many, many more. Now, these can also be on an IEP, but uh, just note that those can be on a 504 plan too. The IEP requires specially designed instruction in the general ed setting or requires one or more services to access the general education curriculum. That's all I have. Uh, this is a very high level discussion, so I would say if you have questions, you can visit our website at www.starbridgeinc.org or you can call 585-546. 1700 and you can be connected with our intake coordinator. I would also encourage you please remember to do your survey so that we can continue to be funded for programs like this at no charge to families. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sue. Um, I just want to um, point out a couple of things um, that we will put this webinar, um, we will archive it on our website. It takes about four to six weeks. Um, it, we, we are required to have it um, uh, closed captioned. So um, look for that in a few weeks from now. Also, I'm going to apologize because maybe um, I didn't upload all the necessary handouts. Um, I see a couple of people asking, um, for the handout on the list of accommodations or on um, the 13 classifications, I will say the guide to meetings and the 13 classifications, if you go to our website, it is under resources. Um, you will find all of that as well as I believe, and Sue, you can um, tell me if this is true, is there a listing of um, typical accommodations on our website somewhere? I don't think there is on our website, but okay. I could include a list from the um, PACER website or from the understood.org website. They both okay. have them so, there. So on understood.org or PACER, P-A-C-E-R website, um, are places you can also Google um, accommodations. Please remember that when it comes to accommodations, it's never a one-size-fits-all. There are things that we would want you to have a discussion with your student or child and find out if they feel that it would be helpful and appropriate for them as well. With that, we do have a few questions as well. Um, one of the a uh, very a great question is someone asked um, my child has an IEP and they're going to college next year can their IEP follow them to college actually it does not follow them to college um, IDEA refers to the K through 12 system once they get to college though they are still covered under section 504 depending on the college they're going to, um, the uh, Americans with Disability Act requires that colleges have an office for students with disabilities where they can request accommodations. Every college has one, and um, depending on what college they're going to, they, you can Google their website and look up their office for students with disabilities. And what I would also caution you is that any, um, every college has a slightly different process for accessing accommodations in college. So you need to look at their website or talk to their office and find out what the process is. Oftentimes, a student's um, high school guidance counselor can help with this as well. So I would encourage you to uh, start a conversation with them. Great, thank you. I have a question where someone is saying, I have a, my child is um, in eighth, next year they're going to ninth grade. I, it sounds like an IEP would work for them. Is it too late to request, um, well, they're saying an IEP, but probably requests for evaluations. It's never too late. Um, I would encourage you to get that letter in sooner rather than later, um, because the at this point, it's the end of January. So by the time a CSE meeting is scheduled, it'll be the end of March. And, you know, the, uh, the um, IEP could be in place by, you know, end of April. And they would have it for the remainder of this school year and then hopefully into the next school year where things might get a little more um, challenging for them. Are, did you say they were going into high school? Yes. Okay, so yeah, that, that is something you're probably going to want to have in place before they enter high school. 
Okay, great. Um, the next question, this is a great question. Um, they say their child is in middle school and last year and this year, the school is encouraging their child to attend their annual CSE meeting. Um, they're nervous about their mm -hmm. child attending. Sue, do you have any suggestions? I would suggest that you have a conversation with your child. Um, I believe one of those um, handout links has the link for the uh, student draft IEP, which can help a child be a self-advocate. And what they can do in advance is write out like how they learn best, what do they like, what don't they like, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And again, they don't have to stay for the entire meeting too. Um, when my son was in, I believe, seventh or eighth grade, he would come for maybe 10 minutes of the meeting and he would just have his voice heard. And if the uh, uh, CSE had any questions for him, they could ask them then. And then he would go off to his class, but he had an opportunity to tell them what um, he wanted to have happen for him. Uh, we often say in this uh, agency, nothing about me without me. So. I would highly encourage a student to um, participate in their CSE meeting to the extent possible. Um, and again, it depends on your student and there's things that we could do to help them to prepare. Call us. Great. <laughs> help. Thank you. Next question is their child is in 10th grade and mm -hmm. is having difficulties taking tests and exams. Um, any suggestions for any other accommodations um, for the student and they're already getting test read? Okay, um, and a 10th grader is, one of the things I'm going to bring up is a 10th grader is probably getting ready to take PSATs or SATs at some point in the near future. And the College Board has its own uh, hoops to jump through, so you're going to want to talk with your guidance counselor about that. Um, in school, you could request um, extra time or a quiet location. I, I'm guessing if the tests are read that they're in a separate location already. But that may not be the case because if multiple students have the tests read, then they could do them all in one room. Um, could I get a little more information about that? <laughs> well, and they can always give us a call as well. That would be great. And they can give us a call, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, deep details. Yes. Um, another question. This is a great question. We get this a lot with bigger districts. Um, does the placement decision, such as what high school, for example, maybe in the city or a mm -hmm. larger um, suburban district, get made at um, the CSE meeting or just the type of program that's determined? So really it looks like, do families have a choice in larger districts of where their child is placed to get supports and services. And we do get asked this question a lot. Yeah, some of the families want their student to go to their, you know, the closest school to them or where their siblings are going. That may not always be practical if they need very specific supports and services. They may, they may need to go to a different building. Um, we always tell families special education is a service, not a place. So we can we can we can ask. You can ask if those services could be provided in a different location if you have a preference, but that may not always be possible depending on what kind of the services they're they're offering. Thanks, Sue. And I know we have chatted with what we call the special education quality assurance um, people. Mm -hmm. They're the, the com almost the compliance officers for New York State. And mm -hmm. as long as it's being provided somewhere within the district, um, that's what the, you know, that, that they're, they're not out of compliance with that. But I love your answer of it never hurts to ask or chat mm -hmm. about what would happen if we did that. Um, I have one more question, but feel free. We're still here if you have another one. Mm -hmm. um, it says, I feel like things aren't going well this year. My child is in fourth grade and they still seem to be struggling. What steps should I take or what should I do next? If they already have an IEP, you could ask for a program review, you could bring up the current levels of performance um, and call for a new CSE meeting. If they don't have an IEP, uh, you have to start that process and get that going with evaluations. Always, the, the first point is to talk to the child's teacher and say, hey, I've noticed my child is not performing as well as other students in his class or her class. 
um, what kind of supports are available. Sometimes there's building level supports that the teacher can provide or ask about. Uh, again, there's a 504 plan option and there's an IEP option. So um, the building level supports might be available sooner rather than waiting the 60 days for the 504 plan slash IEP. Great. Okay, it looks like we're all set with our questions. Sue, I want to thank you for your time and I want to thank everyone else for their time for joining us. Don't forget, the, there will be an email with a link um, to do a survey monkey um, that's getting your feedback and sharing with our funders um, about the training as well as um, don't forget about your handouts. Again, if you have questions, mm -hmm. feel free to call us. Any closing remarks, Sue? No, thank you for joining us. And um, if you have any questions, please uh, follow up with a phone call or an email, and we um, we will be happy to get back to you. Um, if you visit our website, there is a contact page that you can visit where you submit your email, and I will respond in kind uh, with an email, which makes life a little bit easier for me because I'm on the phone a lot. So um, phone calls don't always work, but emails are usually a good way to reach um, Laura and me. Great. Thank you so much, and everyone have a great day. Thank you.